Growth Pod is brought to you by Genero, a leading growth agency in the Nordics. We interview marketing experts, business leaders, and entrepreneurs to uncover the stories and strategies behind profitable growth. Today's guest is Erik Modig, professor at the Department of Marketing and Strategy at Stockholm School of Economics. Erik is also an entrepreneur and the founder of an e-learning platform called Marketing Levels. He's also written four books on advertising, communication, and art. Welcome to the show, Eric. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we'll, we'll just start with kind of uh, consumer psychology, something that you've been uh, spending a lot of your career and time thinking about. So I think just in general, are there any misconceptions you see among marketers and how they think about how customers think about their messaging and their products? Are there any kind of big mistakes there? Yeah, there. Like first of all, uh, marketers tend to think that customers really care about them. Like, of course, everybody. That's like a human human mistake. We think that everybody's so interested about us, but but generally people are not interested, and and they don't pay that much attention, and they do not actually care that much about our product or our 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 marketing or especially not our market communication. So I would say that uh, customers do not care that much. And, and, and that also makes an implication on how do we sell to them? Well, we sort of nudge them towards a purchase with, with small, small steps. It's not like, ah, oh, yeah, now I developed this brand. I love it. Now I'm going to purchase. Yes, we have those kind of customers but not the majority. The majority of customers are low involved and we then give them small, small pieces of information and eventually they know about us. Eventually they start to get a little bit interested. Eventually they've been reminded so many times so that they purchase. And I think that's the, and that's how marketing works. It's not this aha moment we offer our customers. It's more like small, small, small bits and pieces of, of, of influence and persuasion. So do you think then it's, it's a mistake for many com for companies or it's a mistake that companies make when they think we're just going to do this one campaign, we'll put it on the front page of whatever the national newspaper, and then we're going to see a huge increase in sales. And when they don't see that, they get disappointed and they think marketing doesn't work. Exactly. Should they have a completely yeah. different yeah, mindset? Yeah, it, 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 it's a long-term game. So, so you start and then you start, continue and you continue and continue and continue and, and you will probably see no effect for a couple of months. Uh, very little effect, at least, if you want to, to impact a, a broad audience because it's about reminder and frequency and reaching a lot of customers, especially depending on which industry you're in. For example, if you're selling refrigerators, how many customers are, are actually looking for a refrigerator right now? It's not like I see an ad for a refrigerator and I'm like, yeah, I'm going to remove my existing refrigerator and buy a new one because this ad was so cool. cool. That, that's a, that has never happened. It, it's more like, yeah, when my refrigerator break and I'm going to buy a new one, then you will actually be one that I will look into. That's how marketing works to a high extent. And that's actually true for a lot of categories. Uh, so it's more a long-term marathon than a short-term, if you want to be successful. What would you say to, you know, imagine there's a, a CEO or a CFO who's a marketing skeptic and say, okay, so you're asking us to spend month after month after month before we see any results. Are there any metrics you can look at in the short term to justify and say, okay, we're going to see, we, we believe based on these metrics that this is working and the sales will follow in the next months or quarters or years? Well, first of all, uh, you can see it, what is actually happening to, to traffic, either to your website or your store. Of course, going to a store is usually of, of a, then you need to be interested, but visiting to, to a website, uh, if you, if you spend a lot on advertising, you should see a direct increase in traffic or else the ads don't work. However, if you get 1,000 people to go to, to, your, to your website, it's very unlikely that 1,000, like 100% of them are ready to purchase your product. It's more likely that they will go in, look at it and say like, yeah. And then 
they may be going when they see a new ad two weeks later. And then three months later, the refrigerator breaks down or whatever it is, and then they go in purchase. So, so of course, you should see like, what would people do if they saw this ad? And usually then uh, visit the homepage or, or read something, et cetera. And that will then, depending on the industry, result in sale. What do you think about using things like uh, brand awareness surveys um, and, and, and tools like that to, to figure out if you're making an impact in just awareness or consideration for your brand? I, I think it's great to to, to measure brand awareness. Uh, however, uh, for small brands or for new brands, it, it takes a while because when you do these sort of brand trackers, you, you ask uh, like 1,000 people and then you see how many actually uh, know your brand and, and you need to you need to have like a, a market penetration for five ten or fifteen percent to be able to see brand awareness uh, uh, and and if you're a small brand maybe your brand penetration is zero point one percent you will never see that in a brand tracker uh, of course if you're focusing on on one very small market um, that you have targeted then you can see that so of course that is. Uh, a good way to do it uh, because we know that one of the strongest predictor of sales is brand awareness. So, so it's great. However, for small brands or new brands, it doesn't make much sense until you actually start to get some traction. And what do you think about just um, how important is just that brand awareness, just getting, let's say, just as something as simple as getting your logo out there and getting people to remember your logo versus actually delivering uh, a rational message on why your product is better. Like what is just creating familiarity versus actually trying to persuade through marketing and advertising? It, it is much harder to persuade pay people. So, so even though you have a rational message, uh, it depends how fast can you, can you say that? Because it, it, and depending of course on the, on the media channel, but say for example, now we know that Brands usually spend 70, 80, 90% on digital marketing. We know that the majority of exposures in all digital channels, for example, all banners, everything in social, the average exposure time or the, the actual, like the average fixation time, how, how, how long people actually look at that, that's like one and a half, two seconds. That's three to five words. So if you have a rational benefits that you can communicate in three to five words, well, then good. Then, then try to show your logo and then explain the benefit in three to five words. But if you say like, yeah, we, we, have, to, we have to use 20 words and then you fill a banner ad with 20 words, nobody will look at it. And then you make your logo so small so they don't even see that. Then it's totally wasted. Then you have zero effect. Then I would say just... Uh, make the logo much bigger so you at least get some sort of familiarity effect. And then probably you have to buy longer media exposures. Got it. it. Would you say that it's a common mistake that companies try to say too much in one message and also that they switch up the messages too often? You know, they've been do, saying this one thing for two quarters and think, ah, you know, everyone's heard this, they're tired of it. Let's add something new. Do, do you see that as Definitely. a mistake? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, and at the same time, they are saying like, yeah, we want to be like Coca-Cola and we want to be like Apple and we want to be like, yeah, you know, those brands have been saying the same things for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years. If you look at the successful brands, they have saying the same thing more or less forever. So you say one thing and you do it for 10 years and, 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 and that's how you succeed in marketing. So uh, so it's definitely a, a, a sickness in the marketing world that we want to communicate too much. It's not how marketing and, and not how, how advertising work, especially if we're not if if we're buying uh, short media exposures. Of course, if we are uh, having a, a an event or or have some sort of of a native news article in in a magazine then of course we will have longer exposure time and people will read it if we have a full page ad or something like that uh, then we can say more but uh, today a lot of brands invest in very short media exposures and try to say too much in those can you talk about a little bit about the the media so you mentioned that you know now digital advertising is huge um and everyone is, is spending a lot of money there. But there's also this argument, at least some people say or feel, 
that spending, for instance, on TV advertising, that the format, the media actually carries a lot more credibility and weight. So even though, yeah, let's say the CPMs are diff are, are not the same, but do you, do you think that the, is, is there an argument, is there valid validity to that argument that you should think about your media mix, not just where you can get the cheapest impressions? Yeah, an, an impression, this is the most important message of this talk. An impression is not an impression. Really think about, you cannot compare CPMs with CPMs because the quality of an impression it's not a small difference. It's gigantic difference with different kinds of, of impressions. I, can, I, I look at uh, attention data, meaning that I get, uh, in this case, uh, data from Torby, who has pa passive eye tracking panels. So passive eye tracking panels, meaning that we are recording everything people see in screen and match that with their uh, how they are actually looking at the screen. So we actually know what people look at. And if you go in and buy sort of, programmatic banner display and and you're just optimizing on cpm you will uh, first of all they will throw it in desktop instead of mobile because in desktop uh, and and then they will buy super cheap uh, uh ad ads on clickbait sites where they show your ad far to the right or really really low in the bottom uh, the fixation rate of those ads are around two to five percent meaning that for every you buy only two to five percent of the impressions are actually seen and they are seen for approximately one and a half second 1.2 maybe so you buy for one one thousand ads then for for cpm you you get like 20 people or 50 that are actually seen by real people but then you can buy uh the same impressions at the high quality news site still desktop but then you maybe have fixation rates of 40% and they look at your ad 2.5 seconds. So not only is it not 20 to 50 people looking your ad, it's 400 people and they're looking twice as long. Can you imagine how much better that purchase on CPM is? It should actually have been two, 3,000% more expensive, but it's not. So the ones who are selling really really bad impressions earn a lot of money if advertisers do not control what they are purchasing and this is especially true uh for for banners where you buy programmatic because um so so that's the like air all 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 intelligent ad buyers uh, have a will will definitely want to have a complete list of where their ads are placed or they are being fooled i promise you yeah, that's a really good point. And like you said, I mean, often that data is available, but so many agencies and clients alike don't know or don't care. They just see impressions. That's fine. We had an impression target for a brand campaign, whatever. But yeah. and if you see, like, yeah, we get the, oh, we get so much low impressions, uh, so so cheap impressions. We get really, really cheap impressions. We are so effective. No, no, no. Mm. You're being like, you're being screwed. I promise you. Uh, uh, you have to have a control on, on your impression. If you don't get the site on where your banners have been showed on desktop, uh, you're not knowing how to do digital marketing uh, for sure. That, because uh, there are so many sites uh, where your ads is seen and nobody's watching them. Uh, and I think also this is really harmful for unknown brands. You know, unknown brands, if I'm going to tell about if i'm going to introduce a brand i need longer exposures so if, if of course if, if mcdonald's is going to remind me buy a cheeseburger they can do that in 1.5 seconds it's just show a picture of a cheeseburger and a, a nice price and people are like yeah maybe cheeseburger that's nice but if i'm an unknown brand i'm going to talk about my new sauce service you cannot do that below five seconds and then if you're a small company, they say, we, we at least need uh, reach. Let's buy reach with low CPM. Then you get those 1.2, 1.5 uh, impressions, sort of very, very short time, uh, one, one and a half seconds. And you cannot tell about your brand in one and a half seconds. So it's completely wasted. Then it's much, much better to say like, no, we're going to buy non-skippable in-stream. Hmm. Uh, there we have... 
at least five to six seconds. It's non-skippable, so we know that we have at least some time, and it's at least five to seven, six seconds. It will be more costly, but it will be, I promise you, definitely worth it in the long run. The, the really cheap CPMs with, with uh, very short times, it will be completely wasted if you're a new brand. Yeah, okay. I think the takeaway is very clear. If you're a small brand, avoid those like the plague. Do you see any other ways that small brands are kind of trying to copy what big brands are doing and it fails because you need to be a big brand in order to do that in terms of like whether it's media mix or messaging or? Yeah, definitely. Uh, and and uh, I think the advantages of, of small brands is that they don't have to reach that many people to grow. If we're a small brand and we need 1,000 customers, we don't need to reach millions. The big brands, they have the advantage of being a really well-known brand, so they don't have to talk about their brand. But they need to reach hundreds of millions of, 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 of customers. Uh, small brands don't have to have really high uh, reach, uh, but they need to have quality reach to be able to, to educate their customers or just say what who they are. So... Uh, I wouldn't worry that much if a small brand doesn't have that much reach. Of course, it has to be uh, at least some, uh, uh, but it doesn't have to be similar to big brands, but it has to be quality quality exposures. Got it. Going back to a couple of things that we've kind of mentioned, uh, one being the message, um, especially if you're a small brand, you need to get your message down to a very succinct kind of punchy message now let's say you're a company who's you don't really have that nailed down how would you suggest that they go about finding that message is it about a b testing do you need some kind of data can you just rely on judgment from like the the management team and the founders that like this is what we are this is what customers want how do you go about that finding that message mm, uh, i think uh first of all we have to realize that there are two different kinds of messages uh one message that will get the attention and one message that will secure the sales. And, and I usually meet two startups. I, I meet a lot of startups through my, through my e-learning platform. And, and sometimes they're only using one message. And sometimes they are using the attention metrics, uh, a message. That would be, for example, we are AI-driven company. And they say, you know, everybody clicks on our homepage more and read our ads when we say that we are using AI. But nobody buys our product. Why not? Because people do not go around and say, yeah, I'm in need of a little bit of AI. People don't think like that. They need refrigerators. They need uh, uh, that they feel more efficient, uh, more professional, uh, getting things done. Like they, they have real needs. And AI is not a real need. It's a help that can help us with another need. So if we only talk about AI, maybe that will be really highly ranked on, on SEO. Uh, we get message uh, attention but it's not what sales actually uh, sell our product. So so we need to have two different kinds of messages, one that gets the attention and, and one that really uh, secures the sale. And if we're only focusing on what secures the sales, we do not get that much attention. So first of all, we need to focus on two messages. And I would suggest that uh, if the founders uh, uh, have a discussion with some core customers or the first customers, they will figure that out. And then in the second step, they can start A-B testing that. And, and then they will they will find what works and probably you you will you will after a while find uh, one or two or three messages that will work. That's really good advice. What in addition to let's say they follow this process and they find a message that they feel really confident in, um, what are some other ingredients kind of needed for creating successful advertising? Are, are there any? Um, any kind of best practices that you'd always include when you think about crafting an ad campaign? Uh, so unknown brands, all, always your logo. Always, always, no matter what anyone sells, your logo should be in the start of the ad and, and be visible throughout the ad all the time. Uh, if somebody is arguing against that, then you know that you actually, they don't know digital advertising, so you should quit working with them directly they will just harm you in the long term. Uh, you should show the ad directly. One argument would then be from them, their side, they would say like, yeah, but will not people look away if they see that this is an ad from this brand? And and you're, you're, then you say, well, do a better ad. 
do a better ad, do a cooler picture, do something that people say like, ah, this is an ad from this brand, but I still want to look at this. What, what are they trying to tell me? So advertising, digital ads has to be really, really great. So it has to be so great so you can have your logo in it all the time, really big, and people still want to watch it. And you do not fix the problem by removing the logo because then you're destroying the simple reason why you're doing ads. Then you're solving it that you have to do better taglines, better, um, better messaging. And again, going back to where we started this discussion, advertising doesn't work in the way that people look at our ad, we grab their attention, we increase interest, they read about us, and then they come to a purchase. You do that on a homepage. Ad works like, yeah, I, I know that's a brand. Yeah, I've seen that ad. I've seen that brand. I don't know what they're doing, but I've seen it. Yeah, I think this was their name. And then they come into the homepage and then you sell. Ads are there just to build awareness, build familiarity, connect an emotion to that brand. Like, are we premium? Are we budget? Are we cool? Are we nerdy? Uh, are we for families? Are we for singles? Like, that's what advertising are doing. And then maybe we also uh, tell category membership. Category membership is, uh, sort of market membership is where do we buy our products? So markets are a way to structure how transactions are done. Categories are what are we actually selling from the customer perspective? When should they think about our brand? So what you do is you, you write category membership, like this is what we are selling, and then you show uh, your brand, and the design should uh, be so easily uh, recognizable so that you will build familiarity, uh, awareness, and if you're good at it, also evoke an emotion. And that's it. That's how advertising works. And when you do that with a lot of, of, of reach and, and, and repetition, eventually they will come to your homepage. Beautiful. Um, and obviously building familiarity, that requires that frequency and, and I guess also consistency and messaging and all of that. So can you talk about those two ingredients? Are there any kind of best practices that you recommend with regard to frequency? And how do you think about consistency? Can brands test a lot of things or what things need to remain the same, if any, in their messaging? Uh, colors, the same, the same, the same, the same. Logo, the same, the same, the same. Never change colors and, and, and logos, I would say, in the beginning. Of course, if you're a really established brand, maybe you can have two, three colors. But, you know, if you look at Coca-Cola, they have the same filter, the same colors, and they're really successful. So it's not like, yeah, we need five colors to be great. No, you will need one color or two colors and never change that. And you want your logo to be visible at the same, in the same way all the time. Then you can change the message. Uh, but don't change what I saw then category membership. Do not talk about, different things uh you can change it but it's still the same thing because you need to to get a hold of of customers being able to think when should they use you uh so for example even if, even if i'm launching a new product and, and maybe you can you can eat that for breakfast you can eat it for 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 lunch you can eat it for dinner i have to start with one instead of saying but the great thing with our product is you can re eat it anytime yeah but you don't want customers to think of it any time because people do not go around thinking about what can I eat at any time? That's not a category. It's a benefit, but it's not a category. Category is breakfast, snacks, lunch, dinner. Uh, so you have to say like, yeah, start with dinner. And then we say, for dinner, think about this. For dinner, think about this. And then maybe some internal say, about, but you can have, our, why, should, why are we only talking about dinner? Uh, we should talk, the great thing with our product is you can eat, eat it all the time. Well, it's not the category. People do not buy things they can eat all the time. So we have to start with dinner and we do that for a year. And then the next year, we then start to talk about lunch. And then we start about talking about breakfast. And then we are, have, have established ourselves in more and more categories. I think that's really interesting. Would you say that in order to be successful, we have to figure out how customers actually think in terms of categories? Like you said, if customers always think, I'm planning something for dinner, I don't care about something that 
it's not that yet yeah, I, I have predefined categories and any new product that comes in, I'm going to put in one of these existing categories because I don't have time to make up a new category in my mind for you. So would you say that you actually absolutely have to understand how customers think about a product like yours and then adapt your message to that? You can't just go in and say, we're going to change how a million Swedes think about, you know, dinner. Of course, it, it depends on your funding. If you're, if you're a new brand, uh, if, if you, for example, say like, yeah, we are, we are transforming this market. First of all, I would be really scared if any brand said that to me. If any founders are like, we are going to transform this market. We're going to tell something completely new. I was like, yeah, I'm going to run. You will never get my investment because this will, building a new category, that's like a whole of money. But of course, if they say like, yeah, we have like 50 million euros to build this category. And I would say, okay, what happens when you succeeded with building the category? You know, like the MP3 players. There were so many brands building the MP3 player and Apple were just sitting waiting until they have succeeded to build the category and then they were swooped in and took the whole category. So it's also not about we can build this category. Yes, you can build this category. But what happens when you succeeded? Are there any other brands that have could take the category with deeper pockets than later. Uh, if you're Spotify, you can build the category, but then you have to make sure that you have investments to protect your position in the category. Tesla building the electric car category. Uh, if they wouldn't have been really, really deep pockets, uh, other br car brands would have taken that category, but they succeeded to keeping it. But the majority of new brands building a new category, they build it and then somebody else goes in and just take it. I have so many brands have built a sustainability category in their niche. And then the bigger brands just say like, yeah, we also have that. And then they die. So first of all, do not try to build a new category. If you're going to build a new category, you have to have really deep pockets and not only to build a category, but to protect your position within that category when it becomes attractive, because there will be larger brands sitting there just waiting for you, spending money to build a category and then will, they will take it. Uh, look on the evaluation of Zoom, building digital video and, and, and before they succeeded building the, the category, people wanted to invest, but then eventually they built the category and what happens then? Google Meets, Teams, whoosh, swooped, swooped the category, and now they're sitting there. Yeah, we succeeded. That our dream happened. Everybody's using video talks, but there were other players taking it because the category becomes so important. So try to find existing categories and find a niche within that existing category. That's always the good thing. And if you're a B2B product, it's about finding a budget within the company. You cannot sell something in, in the company if there are no budget posts there the last year. It will take you a year until they find a new, do a new budget, and then it's hard. So, so you have to understand which budget are we actually selling to. Uh, and then you can find, I've met so many B2B startups trying to sell their products, and they never succeed. Why? There's, they cannot explain who is going to pay for this. And I, then it will not happen. I think that's so true. And I, th there's this uh, quote about like in, in startup context about first time founders care about product and second time founders care about distribution. Because if you don't understand how to get it sold, you, it just it won't happen. Yeah, exactly. Um, one thing that goes or at least is perceived to go hand in hand with digital marketing is being data driven. Um, what are your thoughts on, on, on data driven marketing? Mm, oh, it's... Uh... Of course, you should be data driven, but do not do not think that data is the truth. There's so much data out there that is uh, not not that good, and and we try to focus on, on on like single source data from one specific perspective, one measurement, and that's you have to be really critical about data. And I think so many people are not critical when they handle data. They think like any data is the truth. No, you can look at data, but, but really think about what it is. And there's also one, there are like two things that could, uh, that is um, the risks with using data. One is that you get reactive instead of proactive. And that is actually seen in a lot of studies. Companies that are more data driven 
try to react to what customers say instead of proacting, educating customers. So you get the view on that the customer is always right and we just have to react to them. But that's not how great marketing is done. Marketing is about changing customers' perception. That's how you succeed, not adapting to customer wants. You should do both. And if you're too much data-driven, you tend to get reactive because we do not have data for the future. So you have to say like, yeah, we are looking at the data. We are really skeptical about what they're saying us, and we still want to become proactive. And then one more risk is that you think that staring at the data will, will solve the problem, but it's not. Uh, it's real hard work that solves the problem. There is no, sometimes when we look at data, we think that the data will tell us the magic sauce and we will find a way through this, but it's not. It's about sending those emails, sending more emails. But if you look at data, we can get more effect out of our emails. Well, if you look at data, you can probably increase the efficiency or, or the effect of your emails with 20, 10, 20, 30 percent. Uh, I know I, I heard uh, when Starbucks uh, added the data, like AI um, analytics to their customer lo loyalty program, they increased the efficiency of the program with 8 percent. And that they've invested how much money? They're like millions of euros to, to, to increase that, that 8 percent. But what you need to do is to send those emails. So if I'm sitting as a founder uh, or a salesperson at a startup and I'm, I, I need to get in contact with 1,000 clients, it's not about sending 10 emails uh, and, and then focus on the data or 100 emails and focus on the data. It's just like you have to send 200 emails a day for six months. Then you will succeed. No matter what you're looking, it's, it's numbers game marketing. Mm. And of course, you should look at the data to increase efficiency, but you also have to think about doing the work. And sometimes I feel that staring at the data will not actually change the data of the future. And I think that's what we need to think about. Yeah, I, I think it's so true. And I, I feel like I've seen that in data can become a crutch. Uh, and also this idea of A-B testing, which I think is good, but you know we don't really know what to do. We don't have any strong convictions. We don't want to make any tough decisions. So let's just test it. And that becomes a standard response. Um, and it, I don't think it, it can be substituted. You can't substitute judgment and creativity and direction and vision with, with data. Like you said, it's not going to, the magic sauce, the secret, the, the silver bullet is not going to emerge from, from data. No, we, we have to look at, we have to be data driven, but we also need to, to stay creative, curious and, and test our visions. Like uh, there's so much data saying that this would work, this wouldn't work. Well, go out, try, and then we create new data and then we'll see. So uh, I, I think that is important. And, and one thing uh, that is important to, 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 talk internally is the difference between efficiency and effectiveness. Efficiency is doing things uh, uh, efficient, meaning that we do not waste that many resources. So we want to be as efficient as possible in a lot of different channels. So I'm investing in banners on at, at Meta. To be efficient, I want to optimize how, how I do that in the best way. Uh, and we are looking at data to that usually helps us with efficiency. Data usually tells us how efficient is this. But it's not that often we get good data to see how effective is it. Like, are we doing the right thing? Should we actually do ads here or should we send emails? Or should we do live webinars? That's kind of data we need to look at. What's effect and effectiveness, not efficiency? And sometimes I meet so many saying like, yeah, we are so data driven. We are, we are really, really analyzing data. And then, then I ask, okay, so uh, how much money do I need to spend to increase your revenues with 1%? And they're like, what do you mean? And I'm like, you're really good at efficiency data, but you do not have a clue about effectiveness data, meaning that where should we spend our money to grow 1%? And that's also the questions we need to, to use data for. Hmm. 
Yeah, I think I, I think you really hit on something really important. It feels like the people who are experts at specific channels like Meta or Google, they can be really good at the efficiency part. But to be effectiveness, you need to understand the whole business. It's a completely different, you know, um, knowledge and, skill set. And, yeah, and, and that kind of data is usually so complex and costs so money to collect. So you cannot do it if you're a startup. Then you need experience. Uh, and you've been doing that for, for have, have done that, and advice and things like that. Like, what should mm. we do? Exactly. Um, but I, I also think... Just one, one, one tip here about channels when we're talking about, I'm at 500 startups. And, and the first question is, are we in the right channel? And I would say out of those 500 companies, 99% is in the right channel. So, so really? you, are in, you are in the right channels. That's never the issue. The issue is that you're not good enough in that channel and you're not continuing pushing in that channel, or maybe you're in too many channels, but you are in the right channel, but you have to realize that it's really hard to be good at one channel. And, I, and that is almost always the case. And, and then I say like, okay, let's look into how good you are at this channel. And then you can find, there are so many things you find where people do, are just showing that they are not putting the effort into the channel. You know, uh, are you good at LinkedIn? Yeah, we're doing LinkedIn. Yeah, but you're also doing the same post on, on, uh, on, on Instagram and Facebook. That means that you're pretty bad at all three platforms. Choose one and be really good at that platform. Uh, and, and you can just get the tips on, on how things work. Uh, we're looking at our data, but don't look at your data. Like LinkedIn, Instagram, they have, they know how to succeed. Just follow the rules. Uh, 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 uh. Stop whining and just do the job. And and that's uh, we have to realize that marketing is not a, a secret source. It's just like hours and hours and following the aggregated data analysis that the platforms, the publishers, the scientists have done and just, just continue, 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 continue. Then you will succeed. I, I think that's really true. And I, I, it feels like um, it's because companies are afraid to focus. Like we're afraid to say, no, we're going to do LinkedIn for the next 12 months and just focus on that. It feels like we're better off by diversifying and doing everything, a little bit of everything. Yeah, because we, 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 we start with LinkedIn and we do not get the good traction the first month or the second month. And then we say, we, we're probably in the wrong channel. No, you're probably not. You're, you're probably right. If, if you're selling B2B and it's some sort of, of, of service, LinkedIn is probably the right you, you just have to do it for, for six, seven months and be really consistent and just follow the guides that LinkedIn or any other expert on LinkedIn not publishing every minute on LinkedIn. So there's no like, your data will not give you a secret. So they, they will not, like, your data will not tell you. You know, it, there, it's there. It just follow it and continue. Then you will succeed. Yeah, that's good. Good kind of reality check for a lot of, a lot of companies. Um, kind of final question. I was talking with someone a couple of days ago about, well, this was in a Finnish context, about the fact that Finland has a lot of great brands that are not known outside of Finland. Like Fatsar, for instance, the chocolate and candy, uh, make chocolate and candies, among other things. Uh, great, great products um, should be pretty much all over the world, uh, but isn't. Do you see any kind of mistakes that Nordic companies make that limit their success outside their domestic markets? Or should they approach marketing differently in a way um, to, to have kind of like to have that success that they maybe find domestically also internationally or globally? Uh, I worked a lot in Finland. Uh, so actually there was a study like 10 years ago showing what you just told and I started to work with Hanken. So I actually worked with Fatsar and, and so I, I worked with a lot of Finnish brands and I would say Finnish, Finnish brands or brand owners they're a little bit too humble they like no we're Finnish why should we do this and, and they are not that aggressive when it comes to marketing so definitely uh, that's one in our personality we are not that aggressive and I also think that uh, in smaller markets uh, we are unused to the budget that are needed to capture a new market uh, when I talked with Klarna 
uh, uh, that are uh, sort of succeeded in, in their global expansion, uh, they were, were like evaluate, evaluated to like, what was it? Uh, yeah, the valuation would could be like uh, at least fifty, I think, bill, billion. Yeah, isn't it? yeah, yeah, fifty. But but I think uh, that's now. Before that, they were evaluated to ten, twenty, or something like that. How much do they they then spend on on their on the global launch when they want to do when they did Snoop Dogg campaign and smooth and everything like that? That was like four hundred million euros. That's a lot of money. And I don't think some of the biggest brands in Finland spend 400 million euros on their, not Fatser. I don't know, maybe. But a lot of brands don't realize how big global budgets are. And I think yeah. uh, I sometimes see that in successful Swedish brands. And I'm like, like are, you, are, you, are your budget in total? 10 million euros and you want to succeed in the nordics and then go into to germany we are talking about 100 million euros maybe so i think uh and and then when they when the marketing managers goes to the board uh that are have been successful in a local market they don't realize that um a market that is five times as big or 100 times uh, as big you need not only you, you need really really big budgets, and you also it's it's an exist and a, and a foreign country you need even bigger budgets. And I think that is uh, they do not go that big, uh, and I think that's a problem. I think that's a really great reality check, and it feels like maybe the rule of thumb for Finnish companies trying to go abroad is to ten x the amount that you think <laughs> you think you need. Yeah. Yeah, and look at Klarna. Their the valuation doubled more or less, and then of course it's got gone down. But it was definitely worth it. And, and look at the. I think they should look. They say, we want to do a Klarna, a Spotify, an Oatly. Yeah, look at their budgets and 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 realize that you're mm-hmm. not even close. Uh, so, like, you just have to invest more. And I think think that's that's a reality check. For sure, um, Eric. It's been a, a real pleasure having you on. What's the best way for people to connect with you and to follow your work and uh, writing? Uh, yeah, the best thing is to connect on LinkedIn. I'm always happy if you connect on LinkedIn, so you will find me there. And then the last two years, uh, I've been sort of trying to summarize all my knowledge into an e-learning platform called now Marketing Levels that I launched this June. Uh, so I like taken everything I've done the last 15 years and put into videos in uh, uh, where you can find sort of anything so so right now we have over six seventy courses uh and different uh, like and we have uh, live q and a sessions with me if you have any questions so so going to marketinglevels.com and i bet you can find any help you need and and if you if we don't have it there just send it to me and i will fix it i promise you but uh either just follow me on linkedin or follow marketing levels on linkedin and we post a lot of material there Perfect. If you found this conversation interesting, definitely go check it out. Uh, we'll also include a link in the show notes. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Eric, and um, I wish you all the best in the future. Thank you so much for, for letting me speak about this favorite topic of mine. Thank you for listening. You can find all episodes of The Growth Pod on Spotify, YouTube, and Apple Podcasts.